Investing in syndications was the rage just a few years ago. And now that interest rates have nearly doubled and insurance costs and other costs have gone up dramatically, many deals are not going according to plan. So what do you do if more money is needed and there's a capital call? Do you put the money in or do you wait to find out if you will ever get that money back? And what should you look for in the operating agreement to make sure everybody's following the rules? I'm Kathy Fedke and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fedke, the real estate investor's resource. Our guest today is Bethany Laflamme, Managing Partner of Premier Law Group, that focuses primarily on real estate syndications and funds. Bethany's clients have ranged from real estate syndicators and developers to aerospace, oil and gas, medical, and technology. And she's here with us today on The Real Wealth Show to share her insights. So welcome, Bethany. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so appreciative. Oh, well, you know, there's been a lot of I guess, negative news in the syndication front. A lot of syndicators are facing tough times. A lot of um, passive investors are now realizing they need to do capital calls, or maybe they should have uh, looked at the underwriting a little bit more closely before doing deals. You're at the forefront of seeing a lot of this. So let's start with, you know, just what are you seeing out there with syndicators today? You know, a few weeks ago, I, I would have told you every every week I'm getting multiple calls about syndicators asking me how they actually execute a capital call or you know, what does the operating agreement say about how to execute a capital call. And in some cases, it was even like right after a distribution. Um, and so, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people getting um, caught somewhat unaware, which is a little surprising. And it's it's mostly people that are kind of new to the industry, right? I mean, my, my clients with a lot of experience, um, they kind of have seen this coming a little bit, have been preparing, didn't give distribution, so they wouldn't have to ask for it back. Um, or, or even some of them made very specific capital call um, provisions just in case this was to happen. But we are seeing um, some people kind of struggling right now and figuring out, like, how do I, how do I deliver this message to my investors and still you know, maintain, um, maintain this indication going forward, because of course this isn't the end. You just have to figure out how to weather this, right. And then get through the other side. I mean, this isn't new. Um, we go through these cycles all the time. It's the ones that know how to survive this period. They're going to be fine. So for a passive investor, what do they need to know during these times? Uh, obviously, uh, the risks are stated in the PPM. So let's start with that. What is a PPM? So a private placement memorandum, a PPM, is really that scary document that tells you all the things that could possibly go wrong that we could think of or that the sponsor could think of, um, of how your money could be at risk to make sure that when you did invest, you understood what that meant for you, it, that you could lose it. Here are the ways you could possibly lose it. And also, even if you don't lose it, here's how we intend to pay you out or allocate losses um, so that you know what to expect when it comes time. So we we definitely uh, encourage all passive investors to very carefully review a PPM. I do recognize that, you know, we're talking about 75 to 100 pages of really boring documents um, that aren't as exciting <laughs> as that beautiful pitch deck that probably got them in, interested in the first place. So yeah. one of the surprising first places that I tell people to look that they don't always think of is the definitions. Actually, um, a lot of times when we're looking at things, we skip over the table of contents and the definitions thinking, Oh, that's just, you know, that's just in there to, to kind of lay the groundwork. And that's exactly right. It is there to lay the groundwork. And I'll tell you that as, as the securities lawyer, that's where I define complicated terms that I'm going to repeat so that I don't have to explain it five, six times throughout the document. And so if you want to understand what you're reading, the best place to start is with those definitions. Some of them are going to be pretty basic definitions, you know, um, legalese or whatever. The things you really want to pay attention to are the fees that the sponsor is going to take. What does that mean? What does the acquisition fee, fee mean in this case? What is the asset management fee even based on that kind of thing? So you want to look at how those are defined and then 
anything um, like a preferred return. How is that defined? Believe it or not, there's more than one way to do a preferred return. So making sure that wow. you understand what was, yeah, what was pitched to you. So making sure that, that things are defined the way you thought. And the other thing that we do is we make sure we define something specifically if it's maybe being treated a little bit differently than industry standard. Cash on cash is a really good example of that. There are people that have differing opinions of what cash on cash even means. So if there's something that's sort of outside of industry standard, we're going to define it in the PPM. So that's the first place to look, really. Wow. Okay. And is it something that the average person can understand or do you have to have a law degree when you're reading the PPM? Hopefully you don't. I try to make things plain English. Really, the standard should be, um, I assume that that people who aren't lawyers need to be able to understand what it is they're reading so they know what they're getting into. And that, that's going to be the standard that most, most people should use. So even like some of our clients will do 506B offerings, which is when, when some non-accredited but sophisticated investors might invest. So I explain everything, assuming that this is someone's very first investment, that they don't know what they're getting into, and I've got to tell them. So hopefully you don't need a lawyer. Now, I would say, though, you should have, if you have advisors, let them, let them review for you, right? But it shouldn't be, so. if it's so complicated that you can't understand, I would go to the sponsor and say, hey, I need you to explain this to me in plain English of how you understand it. And just make sure it's what you were pitched, right? So what you understand of what I wonder if the sponsor. Least, they should, I hope yeah, so. I was going right? to say, yeah. I was going to say, I, I wonder if the sponsor, yeah, would understand. Um, it, it, I know there's been some documents that were confusing to me as well, and I've needed to have the attorneys walk me through it. Well, and I'll tell you this. We, we always offer with our, our deals that there's a few hours. We do flat fee work, but there's a few hours baked in to explain documents to the investors if need be. So I will get on a webinar, not to pitch a deal or anything, but just to say, hey, this is what this means and make sure that people have a chance to answer their questions. So, I mean, you should, as a passive investor, you should always be able to ask all your questions. No one should ever, the lawyer, the sponsor, whoever it is, they should be answering all of your questions to make sure that you're comfortable um, and not rushing you into making an, an investment decision. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about a capital call? When does it make sense to, as for the, you know, the, a passive investor to put in more money into the deal. When are they forced to? Are they ever forced to? And you know, when when does it just not make sense? Usually, they are not going to be forced to. Usually, in a real estate situation, capital calls are not required. That said, a, a passive investor could get diluted, meaning you know everybody else puts in more money and now they own um, a, a smaller piece of of that pie. Um, as a result of not putting in more, but when it would, so it's not really a force, but it, it may be in, in your best interest when I would say it would make sense. And of course, this is always going to be a business decision, a personal financial decision, whether you have the money, whether you don't, but in terms of, of what the syndicator is, is communicating to you is really, you know, things that were completely out of our control, things that we could not really have foreseen have seen requiring additional capital. So not mismanagement, not, you know, something that, that they probably should have known, um, those kinds of things. That's a time when at least you'd want to consider, okay, this happened. It kind of sucks, but I don't want to get diluted. I want, I want this investment to still work. And I believe based on all the new disclosures, because an, a sponsor should be giving you more information to make this new investment decision, right? All of that information should really lead to, hey, if I put more money in this, it's going to protect my original investment. And now I'm going to be able to get, you know, hopefully close to the projected returns on all of this money now. Um, so it, it shouldn't be a, a move of desperation or fear, although it probably will feel like that, right? Uh, it, it should still make financial sense because you don't want to chase a loss. Yeah. So like the sponsor should be offering an updated business plan to show how the additional funds will somehow get returned or improve the project. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it doesn't have to be a whole new thing, right. But just, a, this is how we plan to weather this particular storm. Insurance rates went up for a lot of folks recently, right. Um, interest rates kind of went a little bit crazy for a little while. Like 
um, you know, things like that. So we're raising capital to account for this adjustment that had we known at the time of the investment, we would have, we would have raised more. And this is what this, we think this is going to do to your returns. This is how we think we're going to continue to generate returns or change. Maybe we're changing midstream. Maybe we're like, Oh, that was going to work before, but now it's not going to work. We have to do some different value add or something. So yes, an updated business plan and, and maybe even some updated risk disclosures, you know, um, if something happened with regard to the loan, uh, we've had this a lot, right? Where people are like, we have to go find a new lender. This isn't going to work for us. Um, it's going to cost more. We need to keep more in reserves, whatever it is. Make sure the deal still pencils. So there should be new underwriting even, right? To show you that the deal still pencils. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, are you seeing as many syndicators actively out there or has it, re has it been reduced dramatically? With without rising interest yeah. rates, you know we're a little bit slower. We're a little slower in new deals right now. Um, multifamily is a little slower than some of the others, just because people are really, really underwriting and and being cautious about how they move forward. Um, there are still good deals out there. There are still deals happening, um, but I think people are just taking a little bit of a slower approach. Um, but it's not at a screeching halt or anything like that. I think it's just a little bit of a modified business model. Um, and then some people that I saw that were in multifamily are kind of expanding or branching out in other areas right now, just while, while things kind of turn it around, turn around a little bit. Like storage or in industrial or what are you saying? I'm, yes. We're seeing a little bit more storage, um, even some mobile home park, um, more alternative um, short-term rentals even, which, you know, there are, there's a lot of different schools of thought on whether short-term rentals are still good or still not good. They're still happening. Whether people want to argue all day about whether they're good or they're not good, they're still happening. Um, so I'm seeing some more of that, uh, boutique hotels, land development, um, you know, all, all these different asset classes are, are, they still seem to be doing okay. Great. So you've, you've been syndicating as well. Are you still on the hunt for property personally? You know, I guess I'm syndicating, but I have to be honest, I was never actively hunting for properties. And I know a lot of people out there that are just scouring for properties are going to be like, are you kidding me? Um, they kind of just came to me. Um, you know, I, I do have a very unique position and seat and that I get to take a look at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of deals a year. And so um, I mentioned one time that I thought, oh, it would be really cool to do, you know, to do a boutique hotel. And I called a client of mine and said, you know, for future reference, just keep an eye out. If you see anything, I'm going to want to do some retreats, whatever. And he, he called and he was like, well, actually I have an off market deal right now. So I didn't mean to do it right away. It just kind of <laughs> happened. And that's sort of what's been happening. It's um, so finding the properties. No, I'm not hunting for properties. They just kind of came to me when I told people what I was, what I was interested in and a few others of, of like, Hey, we've got this deal. Do you want to take a look at it? Um, and so it's, it's kind of cool. And then of course I do get a free look at, at all kinds of other deals. So I, I know how people are structuring deals and what's kind of flying and stuff. So that's kind of fun. Yeah. So what is fairly standard in a, in a deal? And let's talk, you know, fees, um, you know, pre preferred return, cash on cash, uh, you know, when, when that, you know, how that, how those uh, waterfalls flow to the investor, what, what's fairly standard or is there such Depending a thing? On the, <laughs> there's not really a standard. I, it's sort of a realm of, of reasonable options, I would say, right. Which is such mm -hmm. a weird thing to say. I recognize, <laughs> right. But so depending on the asset class, so if you look at, at um, let's say multifamily, right, you're usually going to see an acquisition fee around like two, maybe 3%, depending on the size of the deal. Um, an asset management fee around one to two percent of of gross, um, and then sometimes the ones that are not is sort of automatic. We see sometimes a loan guarantor fee of usually around one percent of a loan amount, uh, a capital transaction fee, which could be a refinance or um, or a disposition fee. Usually those are around one percent of either the new loan or the sale price. Um, and then once you get outside of those, it's, it's a little less common. Those are the, the sort of main ones. We don't see a lot of people take all the fees. Um, investors don't usually love it if you take too many fees, but some projects are, are a heavier lift than others. If you have a really heavy value add, there might be some more fees, you know? 
Um, if you've got something that's already generating a ton of cash flow, the asset management fee might be good, right? It might be enough. So it just kind of depends on on what the lift is, um, you know, and then on, on development mm-hmm. deals, you use a, like a construction or development management fee uh, on top of it. And, and how much how, how much is that usually? Oh my gosh, that ranges from like five to 20%, depending on on what the development costs are. So you just kind of have to, what I, what people usually do is they'll figure out what's the, what's the projected return I would like to return to my investors. And then they start with sort of the basics of a 2% asset management fee and an 80-20 split, right? They start there, mm-hmm. uh, maybe an 8% pref. And then when they put that through their pro forma, they figure out, oh, that's crazy high. Maybe let's scale that back a little bit or oof, that's not going to cut it. And so they play with it from there. So that's sort of like the baseline, but you've got to know your investor pool. What are my investors looking for right now? What are other investors looking for right now? You know, about a year ago, it might've been a lot more than it is now, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Depending on on the risk level and all of that, right? You're going to, you're going to expect a higher return on development deal than you are in a cash flowing deal that's given you immediate cash flow. So it just kind of depends on what your investor pool is looking for. And then you, you just massage it based on, on that. But okay. an 8% yeah, our, our, is that. Okay. On our development deal in uh, Oregon, our Ridgewater project, it's a uh, 12% pref and oh, 12 and a half percent and, uh, and a different backend split than normal because of the, like you said, the heavy lift where we've right. got an amazing um, option on the property that, that, took a lot to negotiate. And then of course we're overseeing the build. So uh, the fees are a little bit higher. And I think it's important for, for people to understand the difference. If, you know, if you're, if it's a more simple, you're just buying an apartment and you're not doing much to it, you're going to see you hopefully lower fees on that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and that's something that you, when you're talking to investors, of course, you're going to explain and most of your seasoned investors are going to understand that, hey, I like this asset class. I know it's a little bit more work. Um, that's fine because I'm not doing it. So you go ahead and take those fees, you know? Yeah. 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 You take the fees, just make sure I get my pref. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So with yours, the recent, I don't know if it was recent, but you're, you were able to buy a hotel in Belize. What's that been like um, investing in a foreign country? Uh, at first I was really nervous, but you know, I've, I've had, I, again, the benefit of sitting in this seat is that I've already seen clients do deals in Belize. So I already knew what all the risks were because I wrote them and I already had to check and see what was, what's going on with the government situation there. So, um, I already knew that it buying in Belize is very similar to buying in the U S actually it's a, it's a British Commonwealth. Um, foreigners are allowed to own property there. Uh, and so I, I got to learn a lot of these rules before I had to decide what I was going to do. And one of the partners on the deal lives in Belize and he owns other resort properties in Belize. So I wasn't going into it blind and there's boots on the ground. Otherwise, I'm not sure I, I would have felt comfortable. Um, you know, I, of course, in a perfect world, I would go there every, every other month and, and check on the investment and, you know, then life happens and you're like, okay, it's now been three months since I've been there. So it's good to have boots on the ground, but you know, I got a lot of free looks. That was what was really cool. I, I got to admit, like I, especially for a lawyer who's, you know, diligence, 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 right. I, I got to almost like limp into this deal. I got like a seven or eight month free look because it was off market. Nobody was bidding against me. Oh, wow. got to go visit the property a couple of times, get to know the seller, you know, um, not a typical, typical deal, you know, where you're like, you you may praying for an LOI to get accepted. And then whatever, like we had so many conversations that we were massaging the LOI just, you know, um, for a few months, really (laughs) just. That's far more relaxing. Yeah. Because that's, That's hard when, when the timeline is so short, like some of these multifamily deals just a few years ago, people, I had syndicators coming to me, wanting me to participate in certain deals where they couldn't do any due diligence. Part of the offer was, Hey, we're taking it as is. And then they had to close within a certain amount of time and they had to make sure they raised the money in that certain amount of time. That sounds like high pressure, not something I would want to do. I bet you're kind of glad that those days are over. 
Yeah, no, it's for real. Like that, it's and it's hard because it's really hard to get somebody to invest without any real um, information. You know, you're sort of right. like making educated guesses almost, right? So it's it's tough to pitch a deal with that. Yeah, and people were, but I guess that's why a lot of people are struggling today because they had to make decisions where they didn't have, they couldn't get all the information. That's why I don't really like buying in a seller's market when the seller has the power. I think uh, being able to buy in a buyer's market is is the way to go and we're in one, especially in a, a lot of the commercial real estate world. And uh, and also, you know, one to four units, it's still, it's been a buyer's market, although it could be starting to shift now. We're seeing more inventory coming on the market. There might be a little bit more power to the buyer with uh, with more choices, but we, we shall see. Every time rates come down, that changes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for real. <clears throat> All right. Well, any last tips for our more passive investors out there, how they can protect themselves or what they should be looking for moving forward? Yeah. I mean, the first thing is I mean, diligence, 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 even for the passive investors, make sure that you know, like, and trust your sponsors. It, that I've seen deals go sideways more often because of the team than the market or the property hands down. It, it, if there's not somebody who's experienced on the team, if there's not somebody who you trust to ask questions of on the team, that's that's a red flag. And, um, and also just make sure that you, you do ask questions. Um, don't feel like, oh, I'm going to feel, I'm going to sound stupid if I should already know this or whatever. You know, a good sponsor team is going to want you to ask questions. They want informed investors because they don't want you upset later. Right. So if you're a passive investor and you have questions, ask them, you know, um, and, and who cares if you think it's stupid, it's, it's, it's better than losing your money. And it's better than being in a deal that you're uncomfortable with for five, seven, 10 years. Right. So yeah. I would say diligence and, and asking questions. It's really that simple. It's just take that. the time, take the time to understand what you're investing in, get an advisor to look over the paperwork if you don't know how to interpret it, because it is it's it's a lot. Um, does your company offer that service of reviewing PPMs or wh who can who can they hire for that? So we will we'll review our PPMs that we write for the if the investors have questions. We don't review other attorneys um, PPMs because we represent sponsors. We don't want to create conflicts um, with representing mm -hmm. investors. But we will. So if you have a deal that we'll review the documents with your investors to make them more comfortable and explain to them again, not giving them legal advice, just explaining the documents. And then even yeah. after the deal closes, a lot of times we will explain. So the PPM's done. We don't need it anymore because you've already raised the money. We will then go back and explain, hey, what's this operating agreement say? Because now we're in we're in that world now. Once you're operating, the PPM no longer controls. It's the operating agreement. So, hey, what does this mean? How do we do a capital call? Um, and, and we'll explain to people how operating agreements work for votes or whatever else as well. So the PPM is really kind of the pitch basically, and the operating agreement is the way the company transacts? Sort of. The PPM sort of backs up the pitch to say, okay, we're tempering our pitch with all the risks as well. PPM is really just a disclosure document. It's required under the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission rules, that you provide certain disclosures to people that are going to be passive in your deal. That's what the PPM is. It's just a disclosure document. An operating agreement is the contract. That's how we all become partners together in the same business. Some of them passive, some of them active. So that's the rules of the road going forward of how you're going to operate. Okay. You need to understand both. Well, Bethany, thank you so much for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. I hope to have you back for as uh, I'm sure people will have more questions. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you'd like to find out about our current syndication, Ridgewater in Oregon, we are building homes there. We have a 12% preferred return for accredited investors only. And you can get more details at growdevelopments.com. We are accepting capital now for phase two, which is building the model homes and a couple of spec homes. We already have a wait list of buyers who want those homes. And uh, the business plan is very cool. We got an option on the land, so we don't even have to buy the land until we built the house and have sold it to an end buyer. Uh, so we really lowered, dramatically lowered the development risk. I mean, we don't have the risk, it's already developed. So if you want to find out more about that, just go to growdevelopments.com. I'm Kathy Fedke. Thanks again for joining me here on The Real Well Show, and we'll see you next time.
The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.